Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Amy, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm really excited to talk with you about some of your work um, when it comes to therapeutics with ADHD, but can you please introduce yourself to everybody? Sure. I'm uh, Amy Arnston. I'm a PhD and professor um, of neuroscience at Yale Med School. And how did you get, um, I came across one of your articles called Stimulants about therapeutics with ADHD. how did you even get interested in looking into different therapeutics with ADHD? Well, I, as you'll probably uh, ask me about later, I've been spending my career studying something called the prefrontal cortex, which is um, what generates higher cognition and top-down control. And we realized this was 30, 40 years ago, oh my goodness, what's happening in ADHD is really weaker prefrontal function. So I saw that what I was already studying was directly relevant to ADHD. And um, our overarching goal is trying to create medications to help people with all different kinds of cognitive disorders. And so ADHD actually became the first one where we succeeded in helping people. I, I want to talk a little bit deeper about the prefrontal cortex because it's something that gets mentioned multiple times when I'm in an ADHD conversation. And I feel like me and probably I'm the same general knowledge as some of the general public, maybe a little above average, I'll give myself a little pat on the back for that. But uh, our knowledge on the prefrontal cortex, I feel like is kind of bare minimum. And I'm curious when we have a normal prefrontal cortex compared to something with maybe a certain disorder or like like ADHD or something similar, even bipolar. I don't know if that affects that at all, but is there a large scale difference that you can tell from like, if you do a brain scan or anything like that, to be able to see that the normal does not compare and maybe at what ranking those others would be? Yeah. So um, uh, I can actually show you some of that data with some slides. For example, Judy Rappaport's group at the NIMH who studied thousands of children with typically developing versus um, ADHD symptoms was indeed able to see uh, differences in the development of prefrontal cortex. Uh, so there are changes you can see with brain imaging. And not surprisingly, um, uh, it, it's very likely the disorders that have much more serious um, um, symptoms, like, as you mentioned, bipolar disorder. Or schizophrenia. Yeah, or schizophrenia. Yeah, the the differences are probably much more profound in brain as well. Yeah. I, I think we should start out by saying, you know, ADHD is a disorder um, based on what context you're in. So um, in our current world, where you have to sit still and search through lots of information. We're in the information age. It can be um, uh, a handicap to not be able to sit still, not be distracted, be able to, to really um, guide yourself through lots of competing, distracting information to get what you need. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and, and even in older times, ADHD was probably even selected for the somebody with energy, somebody novelty seeking. Um, these things were um, things that helped society and, and often still do. Um, and, and so um, we need us a, um, a whole variety of cognitive abilities as humankind uh, to advance ourselves. But I think at an individual level in the information age, in school, and also though in many careers, now it can be uh, detrimental. And that's why the diagnosis and the need for treatment so people really can thrive. Is that just going to progress just with the how much we're becoming so involved with more of a sit down technology used lifestyle? I mean, I have a lot of friends that have ADHD and they're very active jobs, um, either something with sports. I work at a gym, um, but I sit behind a desk as well, too. So I have to make myself get out and move around or I'll just be in a complete state of just boredom and um, pain, basically. But a lot of my friends do like construction. They do a lot of hard work when it comes outside labor, uh, whether it's lawn care or something that they have to be moving 
And it's surprising, like for me, like I have to work out for a couple hours before I can go into work or I'm going to be in just a state of lull. So I'm interested, you bring up a really good point, which is that we are moving into more like of a sit down lifestyle, not saying like a laziness aspect, just saying everything's becoming online. You can pay your bills online. You couldn't do that like 20, 30 years ago. So you have so much that's going on that's changing. And this is kind of the inevitable, like it's just going to keep heading that direction, which is to bring up the need for you know, medication and trying to get people to assimilate in this way. Doesn't mean it's for everyone. When I say that, I mean like an artist, for instance, might not need ADHD medication because their job doesn't require that. But if you work in an office setting, it would probably make more sense to be able to help you focus and not feel like you have to take a lap around the building a couple of times every you know hour. Yes. Yeah, so trying to um, match your brain with a career that that works together. Although I once um, saw a video of a composer uh, down in Nashville with um, ADHD, and he said he he couldn't take stimulants and compose, made him too too narrow. Um, so he stopped taking any medication. But then he was so disorganized that he didn't show up to meet with his manager and and get the songs actually. <laughs> He paid, you know, he he couldn't succeed financially. So you need both. And and he was saying that the um the guanfacine allowed him to do both. And we'll get to that later. But um this idea of can we um try to be able to control ourselves where we can still be creative, still have energy, um, but also guide ourselves effectively. I think it's because when we look at like examples of people that might be resistant to medication it's because when they see something of like maybe someone that took too much or too high of a dose and they get into that kind of numb state where it's like they seem like their whole personality shut off that's a fear for a lot of people with adhd because we're kind of built on our giant personalities in a sense whether it's our mannerisms whether it's our impulsivity whether it's something of that sort so i can relate to that and understand that part but I also think that's like also finding your balance. I have friends you would never know that were on medication um, and they just take it and they seem just like how I've always known them to be just, but they're a little bit more on track minded. They're less forgetful about certain things. So it's definitely can help as well too. Yes. And I think um, in our talking about the neurobiology today, hopefully you can understand how they can help, but also if the dose is wrong, why it can be harmful. Now, is there alternatives? You mentioned one a minute ago, but it, alternatives, everyone just knows the basic one, which is Adderall. And I think everyone kind of knows it a little bit more now because it was trending recently about it uh, being a shortage or something like that. And everyone's like freaking out and panicking that they weren't going to get Adderall. And I was like, I'm sure there's other things out there that are similar in some sort, but that might be the most effective. I'm just curious when it comes to other forms, how many medications are we talking about that have actually been looked at compared to how much are in use? So there's a couple of different kinds of stimulant medications that are variations on the same theme. And then there's a couple of different kinds of non-stimulant medications. Um, and the stimulant medications sort of take hold of your brain and do this with, uh, with your brain. The non-stimulant um, medications are usually gentler, which some people say is less effective. And I think it depends um, what fits for you. Um, so um, we can talk about um, uh, what, what those are. Maybe it would be best to do that after going through the biology a little bit so it makes sure. more sense. Uh, um, yes. So. Um, Let's see. Um, should I share my screen? If you'd like. Best part about my show is that it's conversation. So at any time you're able to grab the steering wheel and take it in any direction you'd like. Uh, Cause I thought it'd be helpful to first talk about the prefrontal cortex, as you mentioned before. Yeah that um, uh, people have heard about it, but don't really know what it, it does. And I think understanding prefrontal really helps with understanding what's going on with ADHD. So this is a massive part of the human brain. It's this whole frontal part here. This is actually the motor cortex, but 
everything in front of there. So you can see it's big and it does a lot of things. So uh, what we call working memory, our mental sketch pad, abstract reasoning, flexible decision-making. So we make a decision and then something in the environment changes and it's like, oh, we really should do this instead. Uh, so you're not just fixed. What we all commonly call the executive functions, planning and organization, and very important for ADHD, what we call top-down control of our attention, action, and emotion. So being able to control our attention based on what's most relevant. So a perfect example is you have a math test coming up and you have this really boring uh, math textbook right in front of you and somebody starts doing a video game over there. How do you keep your attention on that boring math book and not look up at the video game? That's prefrontal. Um, uh, uh, something similar with controlling our actions, um, uh, staying in your seat in school, for example, um, and um, not uh, doing things that might give you immediate pleasure, but you know longer term are actually going to be harmful to what you want to have, have happen. And that's a huge range of, of um, activities. And controlling our emotions, like, I know you're really angry at your teacher, but don't yell at them because that's just going to get you in trouble. Or I know you're really mad at this kid, but don't punch him because um, that's going to get both of you in trouble. And it's actually, um, you know, too much of a response for how little has just happened. So that whole realm of inhibitory control we'll see is um, um, very much um, happening in the right hemisphere, but we'll get to that in a moment. The farther forward parts of prefrontal are really important for what's called metacognition, thinking about thinking. Insight and judgment about yourself and others. Am I talking too much and making everybody around me irritated? Um, is this person trying to manipulate me? They seem nice, but really they're trying to get money out of me. Um, and things like remembering to remember. I must remember to remember to ask her this because that will be interesting uh, rather than just having something be a fleeting thought. Emotional, uh, uh, really important things of patience, which relates to what we were talking about earlier about uh, inhibiting things and waiting for the larger reward. Having persistence and hope, knowing, okay, this is a hard task. It's going to take a long time. A lot of failures are going to happen in between, but it's worthwhile and we can do it. I can do it. And then empathy and moral conscience. Um, and, and these often, again, in the frontal pole. Um, having a sense of what's appropriate socially um, and really being able to feel for others. So you can see a tremendous range of really important human uh, um, characteristics. One of the ones on there, the, the bottom, the empathy and moral conscience, that's one that I've seen attributed a lot with ADHD, that ADHD people are very empathetic and they're also very, in, I it would be in the scale of intuitive, but they they know a clear sense of right and wrong. That's what I've kind of seen preliminary most of. The ones that I, I definitely think with ADHD, their problems with is the working memory one, um, obviously clearly the attention, metacognition as well too, insight and judgment. I think like the social cue thing is the issue, but when it comes to like certain details about certain instances, I, that's a, I mean, like I'm really good at picking out if someone's good for a job or not. 
Um, it's like the, the people say like, oh, like, we'll come to me with a resume. Do you think I should hire this person? I just get a vibe about someone. It's not necessarily just me. I've spoken with a couple of ADHD people that usually have good insight or judgment on a particular person case. Um, I mean, would that still like, is there certain things with ADHD where it doesn't affect the whole prefrontal cortex, but there are certain areas that could just be hindered and others could still be normalized? Exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head. Um, and, and these, um, so, and part of that is because the prefrontal seems to be um, specialized. Different regions are um, um, especially helping out with um, certain um, of these attributes. And there's a lot of research that in at least right-handed men um, who are the most lateralized usually, it's the right hemisphere and this ventrolateral region it's particularly important for inhibiting inappropriate impulses. And they can even have a, a typically developing uh, person, uh, uh, adults who don't have ADHD, and they use something called transcranial magnetic stimulation to weaken that part of the brain. And then somebody has a hard time uh, inhibiting an inappropriate response. So you can actually induce an ADHD-like um, uh, profile um, by weakening this part of the brain. So this right hemisphere, uh, lateral part seems really important for this top-down control of attention, action, and emotion, especially this part for action in inhibiting something that's inappropriate. And um, what's been shown is that this area is slower to mature or is actually smaller in many pe um, people with ADHD. And for example, um, there was an amazing study out of the National Institute of Mental Health, the lab of Judy Rappaport, um, where um, Philip Shaw in her lab looked at typically developing children from age four to 20, and then compared them uh, to those with ADHD. And this was thousands of kids. They were able to really look at, at large numbers of kids in, in this group. They've done that for, for um, many disorders. And what they see in a typical developing brain is that the left side starts out bigger, but as you go to age 20, now the right side becomes bigger. And they think this is what we call emotional maturity, that as you get older, you're able to inhibit inappropriate responses. So in a four-year-old, we don't expect them to do that. As they get older, we do expect it, and they become very good at it. Well, in ADHD, that doesn't happen. The left side stays the larger one. The right side doesn't grow as much. Um, and so this would fit with either it happening more slowly or not enough so that this area is not as effective in those with ADHD. And this fits with the brain imaging studies that have been done for decades now where this area is underactive in those with ADHD as they're trying to inhibit an inappropriate motor response. And um, they also see that these motor areas that get engaged to actually carry out the inhibition uh, are also less. So it's the, the whole circuit um, then being less efficient. Is there any benefit to having a left side bigger than the right side, like with ADHD? Um, so the left side actually um, um, is uh, in, in many uh, patients or, or people is thought to be the cheerleader. So the left hemisphere in a right-handed um, uh, person uh, does language generation. So that's where Broca's area is. And it's um, thought to be the, the yes hemisphere. So the right hemisphere is saying, no, don't do that. Inhibit that, that's gonna get you in trouble. The left hemisphere seems to be more the cheerleader. And, and the real data on this come from the depression field. So 
it's been noted for decades that people who have strokes or tumors or demyelination in the left prefrontal get depressed. And then uh, more recently, it's been shown that using transcranial magnetic stimulation to strengthen the left side is antidepressant. Whereas um, uh, what you have to do as an antidepressant for the right hemisphere is deactivated. So um, having more left uh, uh, prefrontal, one could speculate that that would be antidepressant. And part of maybe the jubilation of being ADHD, might you agree with that? There's a little bit of a, uh, what I would call a simplicity in it when you don't notice the social cues, like you don't know when you're being annoying and you don't know when that, but it also can turn immediately sour and there becomes this spiraling of a downside of it. And I, I looked it up and someone described it in the best terms, which was like falling into a volcano or something like that. And it's never ending. I'm like, yeah, that does happen. And that's where shame comes in with ADHD, which turns into like an inevitable downward where just all, everything turns sour. But if you... Medic, does medication do anything to that? If you had someone on a young age on medication, does that make them grow equal or make it have a different effect than just the left side being bigger? Because I've seen with, um, I know ADHD, we don't respond to certain chemicals, dopamine and a bunch of things like that, that just our brain naturally just doesn't produce as much of compared to maybe someone who doesn't have ADHD. But well, also- that's not, that's the myth. I think that's actually not true. It might be true for a small number of people. Um, but it's, um, or, or for some, but uh, that that was kind of the simplistic idea of ADHD. people with ADHD don't have enough dopamine that a stimulant provides it and normalizes it. And that may be true for some people, but it's a very heterogeneous condition in terms of what genetically is actually causing things. And, and so um, uh, um, it, it it's not that simple in that way either. And to get back to what you're saying about the shame, and uh, yes, you might be having, um, you know, kind of lost in your own happiness there, talking, missing the social cues, and then realizing, oh, I've alienated this room, and then cratering. And um, that's one of the main reasons why um, why everyone thinks treatment, whether it's pharmacological or otherwise, is so important because um, untreated ADHD can very much lead to um, depression and substance abuse where people are trying to self-medicate. So really important <clears throat> to help people because in the social realm, that's one of the most important areas where we're needing. Um, so prefrontal is really important for social cognition being appropriate in ways that that um, allow you strong relationships. And so what we can do to enhance prefrontal and <clears throat> allow that to happen is especially important for kids. Now, we, we talk about the left side being bigger than the right side for kids with ADHD. Does that not sound like it's a different, I mean, it almost sounds like a different species. I know obviously we're humans. I'm not saying that we're not humans, but there's something going on there. So that has to be a chemical, something that is not being distributed properly. Then how does a brain be so different if there isn't something that isn't giving it what it is? Does that make any sense? Yeah, no. And I think it's, it's probably more uh, complicated than that. There are many genes involved with brain development. And so you can have um, multiple different kinds of genetic changes that could lead to that. So, you know, ADHD is really highly heritable. It's as heritable as eye color. Um, and, and but it could be um, for a different reason for one family than another. And we're just beginning to understand some of the genes that are important for um, prefrontal development. And the fact that it's just this one area <laughs> You know, the rest of prefrontal seems pretty normal, um, the, um, which harkens back to what you were saying before, that the people with ADHD still have empathy, moral conscience. Um, uh, so many things are um, very much uh, healthy and the same. 
it's the working memory is also this lateral prefrontal um, uh, and and um, the kind of impulse and, and control of, of actions and attention. So, and you can imagine it would also not be the same for everyone with ADHD. There could be um, uh, real heterogeneity. And so at least some differences in symptoms, that's how you can get people who are ADD where they um, have, they're distracted daydreaming, but don't have problems with the motor aspects. So, you know, the classic thing is the little girl in the back of the room who's very good at staying in her seat, but can't pay attention to the teacher because she's daydreaming or her attention's captured out the window. She probably has a, uh, um, a little different um, circuits affected than uh, the kids who also have the um, problems with the physical motor impulse control. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think a lot of it also leads from, if you talk about some of the, I, I guess not being stopped, like for instance, anything that I could really describe is probably one of my best traits is because there's this like emotional empathy. We could talk about that. That's a good example. Like that comes from your ADHD people are very emotional. So we understand what that's like. We have a little bit more of that. So that could lead to just overall connected a bigger part with empathy as they get older, it kind of doesn't just fade away or people don't get kind of numb to it because they've spent so long being in touch with their emotions, not in the sense of like they understand every single emotion, but they experience a wide range of emotions to be able to understand maybe what someone's going through and be able to relate. The impulsivity factor is because of the patient's aspect. There's none of it there on things that don't interest us. I can get focused into something like a painting or something, but it has to be in that moment that I want it. If I don't have it in that moment, it'll, it'll just go away or fade away, which that doesn't function for a normal society. You know, if you have to attend a speech, if you have to attend a lecture, if you do anything like that, if it doesn't interest you, the next thing you know, you're tapping your foot and you're diving into the hyperactivity. And that, the next thing you know, you're on a whole different subject. Exactly. Whereas with um, uh, proper prefrontal, you'd be saying, I know this sounds boring, but it's on the test. And you need to pass this test if you're going to get to be a whatever astronaut or whatever you're wanting to be, you know? Um, so those kind of long range goals, helping you in the moment to get through something boring, because even though it uh, doesn't have some sensory um, capturing you, it has a relevance to your future goals. So, um, which is very internal, right? You have to generate that kind of thought yourself of this is going to be important to me in the future. That's very different from a beautiful painting capturing your brain right there. And um, as we're going to see if I, um, a couple slides, prefrontal is uh, got this amazing ability to generate these top-down goals all by itself, doesn't need the sensory stimulation. Uh, but it's a very fragile process and it needs everything just right to be able to do it. I've heard I've heard of Shaw's work. I think the person I was mentioning earlier that might be a little outdated. Is, have you ever heard the name Shankman? I'm forgetting on his first name. Not sure. Um, he's a psychologist. I'm just don't, I'm blanking on his first name. It'll come to me. Trust me. I, I'll remember this either in the middle of the podcast or after the podcast. But uh, the quote for him that I was trying to find was... Uh, ADHD is the brain's ability to produce as much dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline as regular people, uh, people's brains produce. Because of that, our brains have become faster. When managed right, they, they, that becomes a superpower, which I question all the ADHD superpowers because it's like, yeah, you have to put it in context. Um, Hyper-focus isn't really a superpower. I would call that more of a- Yeah, um, and, and I disagree even with the first part of that. Um, you know, I, I, I think for a lot of people, it's not because they don't have enough of those monoamines. So uh, it's much more complex than that. So I, I would disagree um, with some of that statement. Well, it's, it's the, like I said, it's the psychologist Shankman's work. I mean, if you talked about, about like, let's say serotonin, for instance, something, if you're going to get something when you sleep or whatever you get when you sleep, if you don't like common ADHD problem is insomnia for a lot of people have sleep disorders with ADHD that for a prolonged time without being checked, that definitely is going to affect your brain development, especially if it's from a young age. 
Yes, but it doesn't necessarily because of serotonin. So this is what I'm saying is people have gotten into this metaphoric, you know, uh, what the dopamine's pleasure, serotonin, sleep. Um, and and these um, are all neurochemicals that act at huge numbers of receptors. Serotonin has 13 receptors. They do in whole variety of things, often opposite things in one circuit versus another. And um, the way the kind of neuroscience can be taken and turned into inaccurate metaphors, um, I think can harm progress because then people are confused about why a medication is doing what it's doing. So you have to be um, careful about that, that um, the the neuromodulators, these arousal chemicals, are much more complex. And it's not as simple as ADHD patients don't have enough. I'll say, but then that'd be a core issue of the industry then, because don't they sell melatonin and other types of things that try and produce those chemicals in jars and bottles and people buy them? That's not how melatonin works, actually. So, um, um, mel and, and, um, so melatonin is part of a whole system in the brain with circadian rhythms. So again, it's more complex than that. It's not just that serotonin makes you fall asleep. Okay. Usually people talk about uh, getting tired after uh, eating turkey. So I mean, that's an old wives tale then. Uh, there's some of that, but it's much more than that. So um uh, and and uh, people eating the turkey are also usually eating huge things <laughs> at that point, not able to move. <laughs> so I'm not saying serotonin isn't involved, um, but um, you know, actually, the raphe neurons shut off during during sleep. So. No, I'm with you. I, like I said, I'm I'm not like confined to any certain this 100% this is how it goes. I've just started to notice that a lot of things with ADHD, there's kind of like a, I wouldn't say a double-edged sword, but it's kind of like a back and forth. Like it's kind of a lot per case per case basis. It could be an individual difference between someone. And I'm not saying about brain chemicals and chemistry like that. I'm just saying with certain instances, like when it comes to certain actions of ADHD, some people might have some hyperactivity, some people might not. So it's a lot of like research and what I've talked to with some ADHD psychologists like um, Stephen Farone and a bunch of others, there is certain instances where this is like the most priority, like primary thing a lot of people with ADHD experience, but then there's also a bunch of other things where other people experience something else. So it's not like a 100% like this is the answer to this. It's more about like, it's kind of in a spectrum a little bit. Like there's a more people would experience this, but then others don't experience it. And they experience something similar to this, which is why you can come across a whole host of information on ADHD when you're trying to just learn about it on the internet or just research about it. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and, and um, here we were with the attention, which I think is more um, that, that these are symptoms that, Everybody with ADHD has trouble controlling their attention. That's that's why it's called ADHD or ADD, um, even if you uh, don't have the, the motor impulse. Slides help. Slides help. The um, so um, I wanted to get into how by understanding um, what prefrontal cortex needs chemically we're starting to understand how the medications work and actually develop new medications for ADHD. So one of the things that's really different about prefrontal cortex compared to other parts of the brain, it has what's called a, a very narrow inverted U dose response with arousal state. So either fatigue or uncontrollable stress will impair prefrontal, and it has a very narrow window where it functions optimally. And it's these arousal chemicals that you and I have just been talking about, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and acetylcholine is uh, another key one, um, that are these arousal modulators. So we have, um, um, they're shut off during deep sleep, interestingly with 
REM sleep, we have a little acetylcholine activity. And then increasingly more, and when we're stressed, we have really high levels of these arousal modulators. And what I'll be showing you is prefrontal circuits need a moderate amount uh, to function properly, but either too little or too much, and they're unable to connect and prefrontal function is weaker. And so the goal of medications is can they put us in this optimal state? The One of the, the real challenges is um, different people make different amounts of, of these arousal modulators. So for example, there's enzymes that destroy norepinephrine and dopamine and a common genetic modification um, makes this enzyme weaker. And so those people then have more catecholamines. Uh, norepinephrine and dopamine are called catecholamines. So there's variety in how much of these catecholamines, monoamines and acetylcholine our brains make and um, how quickly they get destroyed. And so that's part of why people can have a different response to medications. Is that also because it's kind of like a beach ball? It kind of bounces back and forth. Um, yeah, obviously also across a course of a day, you know, as as you get tired or if you have an event like your internet going out that stresses you. Um, so there's a lot of bouncing around based on environmental events and fatigue. I know I'm useless for, for writing things by like four o'clock in the afternoon. I really have to be uh, writing and doing challenging work in the morning. So getting to know yourself, what are your own rhythms? When are you at your best? What sorts of things um, push you in one direction or another? Can you help yourself with that? Well, I wonder, because like even with ADHD, there's a thing about like second wind where it's like no matter how tired we get, I get it all the time. It'll be like, I like I said, I work overnight, so I'll go into work and I'll, around 10 o'clock is when I'm like, I look like I'm about to crash, like it's going to be, but then give me 20 minutes, I'll be up and back to normal again, no matter how tired I am. It's like that feeling just goes away. I'm probably still tired. I'm just, my brain's not focused on anymore. It's like I capture that second wind a little bit and people go, oh God, I wish I had your energy. I was like, you don't that's want That's that. right. No, that's exactly the point about how our society needs all kinds and why people with ADHD um, are valuable now, but would be particularly valuable in the past. And you can imagine, like, you'd be great as an ER doc who has to be all night, right? <laughs> so um, there, there are many uh, situations where having that increased energy uh, can be useful. But would you be able then to really focus in on a difficult case, let's say, um, in, in that state, if you're having to not be distracted and instead focus on something that's subtle, but what's really relevant. So how can we uh, have it all? Um, and so part of trying to understand what prefrontal needs, so we can try and optimize our treatments. And I just wanted to give a shout out to my mentor, Patricia Goldman Rakish, who really transformed the field of uh, prefrontal cortex. She uh, really provided the first cellular understanding of how it works. And this fundamental idea that what prefrontal can do that other areas don't seem to be able to do on their own is they can excite each other to keep information in mind, to generate these top-down goals, without any sensory stimulation. And that's a huge evolutionary advance to not just be um, uh, uh, a slave to what's happening in the environment that you can think independently, act independently. But this is a really tough thing because these neurons then are having to excite each other without any of this kind of sensory input to get the ball rolling. And so doing that is, is um, really a, a very sensitive chemical challenge. And what my lab has learned is it 
um, this process of one cell exciting the next, here's one cell exciting the next at what's called a synapse. This is the dendritic spine. And it involves glutamate being released onto what are called NMDA receptors. And um, these are very fussy receptors and they only open if they're sitting in an electrified membrane. And one of the things that really helps with that is having calcium. So what we're learning is that moderate levels of norepinephrine and dopamine are needed to put this in a state where the NMDA receptors can work and this cell can effectively communicate with the cell and pass the message along and get this excitation going and keep it going. So we really need some degree of norepinephrine and dopamine for these um, neurons to support each other. And the theory is that this is what therapeutic doses of stimulant medications are doing. They enhance the amount of norepinephrine and dopamine. And norepinephrine is often forgotten. They all have effects uh, enhancing norepinephrine. Uh, and in fact, in some parts of brain like prefrontal, the norepinephrine may be even more important. And so uh, at an optimal dose, you are really allowing these circuits uh, to connect and communicate to generate these top-down uh, goals where you can guide your own actions. But what happens when we have too much norepinephrine and dopamine? And this is what happens with stress exposure. I should say stress, especially where you feel out of control, it can be a very mild stress if you feel out of control. It can be a profound stress, but if you feel confident and I can do this, then this doesn't happen. So the uncontrollable part of it is really important. And what we find is with these high levels of catecholamine release, we open what are called potassium channels, and this just shunts the message. So this cell is no longer able to activate this cell. And I feel this in myself where my uh, something rotten happens often quickly, I find out a grant's been rejected and we won't have any money and what are we going to do? And oh, my mind goes blank. Just, oh, and, and um, so these potassium channels opening so we can no longer uh, have these cells exciting each other. It's why they and, give monkeys bananas. Why do you say that? At, at a zoo, they give monkeys bananas if they get angry. Usually it's also a reward factor too, but it calms them down. Oh, I no, I actually think uh, you're thinking of the potassium in bananas. Yeah. No, the potassium. It was, it was a jib. Making was a jib. it worse. Yeah, uh, the potassium a... would make it work. And yes, um, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, uh, eating something yummy can calm a lot of people uh, or animals down. Yeah. But we think this is what happens when the dose of stimulant is too high. So abusive um, doses where like people shoot up stimulants uh, clearly impairs prefrontal. But even uh, what is considered a therapeutic dose for some people might be too much for others um, and impair rather than help prefrontal function. Do you have a lot of people that get stressed and take another dose of stimulant like their medication to see if they can calm down their stress? And then it makes them worse. So by the way, I'm a PhD, I'm not a MD, so I don't have patients. Um, but I have heard of very much, including friends, who uh, take another stimulant under those conditions, thinking it'll make them better, and instead it makes them worse, and their hmm. heart pounding and whatever. So they usually learn pretty quickly uh, under those conditions, actually cut back on a stimulant medication, you know, because... Um, you're now too far over to the right side of that inverted view. So um, um, one of the things that can really protect prefrontal project, uh, pro, uh, connections and, and um, can be helpful under conditions of either too little or too much catecholamines is norepinephrine stimulating what's called the alpha-2A receptor. 
And um, this is what the medication guanfacine does. And it stops the opening of these potassium channels and strengthens the connectivity. And it can do this under stressful conditions or under conditions where you have too little uh, catecholamines. Um, and, and so we can actually see this in the animal studies with it protecting and strengthening prefrontal connections. And guanfacine is... Um, the brand name is Intunov, that's the extended release formulation. And it was approved to treat ADHD back in 2009. Um, and uh, it's also used off-label to treat PTSD, especially in kids, traumatic brain injury. And interestingly, um, uh, uh, Dr. Yale's finding that it helps people with brain fog from long COVID, especially when combined with something called N-acetylcysteine. So this can be a way of, of strengthening prefrontal con connections and can be particularly helpful for people who are anxious or, or stressed for whom stimulants are, are a problem. That was the one really good positive that came out of a horrible negative with long COVID, which was the brain fog, because um, not saying that the brain fog was good. I'm saying that the fact that now that that has now become a more known name to people who don't have a disorder, that the research into that now is pretty is getting pretty extensive. I've talked to a lot of people about the long COVID and brain fog, that issue, and they said that's going to be good for other disorders that have that as part of their disorder. So now it's like helping out this area of people that maybe a small number of people that experience brain fog, not because a lot of people now who either had COVID or gotten over COVID experience brain fog. So the research went full in to try and understand what that was. Exactly. And um, brain fog especially uh, impairs prefrontal function, and our data are exploring why that is, and we, we think we have um, several explanations for why these particular prefrontal circuits are so vulnerable to inflammation. And so you have this spectrum of deficits across many disorders that are shared and due to dysfunction of these circuits. Yeah. So... Um, uh, there are also other non-stimulant medications like atomoxetine, uh, which blocks the norepinephrine transporter. And so it doesn't lead to large increases in dopamine and what's called the striatum, uh, increases both dopamine and norepinephrine in um, prefrontal cortex. Our um, data show that it has a more narrow inverted U, so you have to have the dose um, just right. Um, but uh, some people use atomoxetine um, in, instead of taking a stimulant. A lot of people that I hear of take a combination of guanfacine and a stimulant because their therapeutic effects seem to be additive and their side effects cancel each other out. Also, guanfacine acts all day long, so it doesn't keep you awake at night. You can um, um, have it on board um, like after dinner, and, and so you get more of a 24-hour help with it. Its side effects are sedation and lowering blood pressure. Um, and the sedation usually wears off, but some people on purpose take it at night. Now, guanfacine is your lab's medication? That's what, yes, our lab um, developed it based on understanding the um, how helpful it was to prefrontal function. Now, is it available, though, for anyone to be able to get? Yeah, I mean, it's a prescription, okay. but it was approved by the FDA in 2009 for treating ADHD. Um, and it's been generic since, I think. 2013, so it's, I think, pretty cheap. Um, guanfacine was actually approved by the FDA for um, treating high blood pressure 40 years ago, but it's not very good at it, so nobody uses it for that anymore. But in terms of proven safety, people have been taking it for about 40 years now. Is it doctor record? Like, do doctors know about it and recommend it at all? Like I said, the only times I ever hear about ADHD medication or anything for treatment of ADHD is only Adderall. I really haven't heard of alternatives, unless you're talking about like yoga. <laughs> yeah, I think that 
Um, if you go to a, a general practitioner, they probably know very little. Um, but um, if you go to um, a psychiatrist or somebody who specialized in ADHD, they sh sure as hell should know about it. There's not just Adderall, there's Vyvanse. So um, the stimulant medications, there's <clears throat> methylphenidate was the original one, <coughs> which is still available. And then Adderall was the um, next generation using amphetamine salts. And there's slight differences between amphetamines and methylphenidate. And for some people, one or the other is better. Um, and uh, then Adderall was an extended release uh, preparation of the amphetamine salts. And then the same company went on to develop Fivance, which is a formulation that can't be abused because the concern with Adderall is people could snort it or shoot it up, you know, crush it up and put it in solution and get high from it in ways that were really destructive to their lives and made prefrontal function worse, you know, um, had um, real addiction potential. Vivance, you, um, if, if you try to snort it or shoot it up, um, it doesn't even get into brain uh, or it's it's complexed in a way that if it's in the brain, uh, um, it, it doesn't act as a drug. You have to um, eat it. And then I think it probably be in the intestine. It's digested in a way where there's this slow release of essentially the Adderall, the amphetamines because it's the slow, low dose that's therapeutic rather than um, the big, huge pulse is what gives, gives people a high. So the kinetics are really important. So for someone, especially if you're worried about abuse potential, the advance is a much better choice. I know that's probably multifactorial, but for the Adderall shortage, are people, is that a possibility people are snorting it? Um, I've heard that the shortage is due to two things. One, that the, um, the government limits how much can be made because of the abuse potential. And then um, the other thing I heard is that <clears throat> during COVID, um, people having to work from home with so many distractions, a lot of people felt like they needed ADHD medications to get their job done better. So there was actually an increased therapeutic need um, for Adderall. And I think many people like you have only heard of Adderall and don't know about alternatives. I also think uh, maybe over diagnosis of ADHD too. I know a lot of people that don't have ADHD that said, yeah, my doctor told me I had that or something of that sort. I'm like, what, where, where are you going to get diagnosed that you have ADHD? But there's, like I said, there's just a large amount of what you, what you call symptoms that could be attributed to ADHD, but it's not kind of the core. It's not, you know, if you just have one doesn't mean it's necessarily ADHD, ADHD. Kind or of they, they might have ADD. So you're not recognizing it, right? It's easy to see somebody with the H, the hyperactivity, poor impulse control. That's visual. You can, you can watch somebody do that. You can listen to somebody do that. If they're daydreaming and can't control their attention, you're not necessarily going to be aware of that. So you're not necessarily uh, an appropriate judge of who has ADHD unless you really talk to the person and find what they're having trouble with. Yeah, but if they're just talking about something like being inattentive, that doesn't mean that they have ADHD. And a lot of people I'm talking about to say that I can't focus on things. It's like, well, you're in your 30s and you're working at a job that you don't like. You're not going to be focused into what you're doing. No. So, Robbie, that's called ADD, right? So there's ADD, which is attention deficit disorder. I'm I'm aware of that, but I'm just saying the common, like I said, the common symptom that necessarily doesn't have to be ADHD or ADD. ADD is not if you're just a, someone in your 30s and you're working at a job that you don't like, you're not going to pay attention. That's necessarily not a symptom of ADD or ADHD. It could just be you're not happy with where you're at in your life at that job is what I'm saying. These are the people that I say that you don't have ADHD or ADD. You're just in your 30s and you're working at a job that you don't want to do. This is not what you thought of that you want to do as a kid. But that's a lot of people now go, oh, yeah, I was diagnosed with this or something like that. I'm like, 
how did you describe it right? Like, I don't understand what that could possibly be because I just don't, I'm not even paying attention to the hyper spot, but, you know, saying things like depression, other things that could be a uh, core element that could be ADHD or ADD that could lead to anxiety or depression. I understand that. But then just talking about like, if I say, if I have anxiety, cause I don't know this social situation, I got to come up, I got to prepare myself for and someone goes, Oh yeah, I do that too. I might have a little bit of ADHD. It's just like, that's not necessarily ADHD or ADD. You might just have anxiety because it's a scary situation that we probably all experience the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Does that make a little bit more sense? I'm not diagnosing people on the street or anything. I'm just saying a lot of people are now throwing out that term. Like it was like, it's cool to have this type of thing. And I'm like, it's not, and it wasn't when I was a kid, but now everyone seems to like, now that there's a lot more, I guess, stigma taken out of it, everyone seems like they have it now. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. I think what they're using ADHD or ADD to describe is prefrontal dysfunction in some situations, right? And they don't know, uh, which can be part of depression, anxiety disorder, et cetera. Um, and, or as you're saying, certain environmental conditions can create prefrontal dysfunction, um, but they don't know enough neurobiology to describe it like that. And they see something similar in themselves to you. And so they attach to that label. So I, I see ADHD getting used in, in place of saying I'm having prefrontal deficits. Because I necessarily don't have the anxiety issues that roll with uh, ADD or ADHD, but I still get nervous if I'm going to go give a speech or something in front of a large audience of people. Because I'm like, that's a anxiety situation that's a normal thing it doesn't mean it's a part of my adhd or anything that's just a normal thing to be worried about because you don't want to like fart or anything that would be terrible <laughs> in front of everybody come on <laughs> yes really normal yeah uh, no. sorry i tangent a lot i'm sorry <laughs> yeah, well that's how you get to see the prefrontal um weakening within the cognitive process itself, that prefrontal might uh, normally be saying, you don't have to say about the fart because it's, it's already you've made your point and it's clear, but it's so evocative and oh, wouldn't it be fun to say that? So you go ahead and say it. And, and someone who, who uh, was like, no, I'm wanting to be more socially appropriate across audiences, so I'm not going to say that phrase. Oh. <laughs> so how we carve out what we, we especially say out loud is um, a, a big part of this, this prefrontal top-down control. Plus, I've learned in my experience that with humor, it tends to soak up the information a little bit better. Um, especially in a lot of and humor is often linked to shared experience. So that's a shared experience. The first thing my brain could think of that would be a shared experience. Yeah. So I think this is my last slide. Um, but does that give you a, a better sense of um, how medications might work and, and uh, also getting this idea that there are many more options than just stimulants and just Adderall. Now, was this like this in the beginning? Like where there's a lot more open openness to other forms of medications besides Adderall? Because like I said, the people I've talked to so far have been stuck on the one basis of just taking Adderall because it works. Um, so I've, the, the alternative methods thing is kind of new to me when it comes to being recommended another it's form. Su it's surprised to me because actually what for 15, 20 years, there've been alternatives. So um, I think many people never go to a, um, a specialist to get treatment. Um, and, um, you know, so even, it, it, I mean, the fact that Adderall is out there in the media because of uh, problems with it, not because of good things, right? So it having captured a, a attention, but really, um, there has been much more available, and um, a doctor specialized in this field would be knowing about that for, for 20 years or so. So for um, the longest time, I guess going back to the 80s, methylphenidate, Ritalin, was the only thing that was available. And then they made a 
longer acting version of methylphenidate as that technology became available, learning how to make drug um, formulations where the drug would get released gradually over time. So you wouldn't have to go to the nurse's office at 11 a.m. to get your second dose and have the stigma of that. Um, I actually remember that too, for some reason, that kid used to always go at a certain time to go take medicine, but I never knew what it was. Yeah. Yeah. No. And you can imagine how disruptive that is if, you know, they class trip or things like that. So um, the invention of these long acting formulations was really ingenious um, and, uh, and allowed for <clears throat> um, a drug like methylphenidate to then act all day long. And then this recognition that ADHD is actually very prevalent. There needs to be alternatives. And, and so um, uh, the development of first Adderall, which is this um, amphetamine salts, um, which is a variation on methylphenidate, They're, they both um, affect the dopamine and norepinephrine transporters which normally suck catecholamines back up into the presynaptic terminal. So um, if this was, let's say, a norepinephrine axon terminal, it'd be releasing norepinephrine. And then there's transporters here that suck it back up as a very, it's recycling, right? Re, uh, Mother nature's efficient and repackage it for, for release. And if you block those transporters, then you have more norepinephrine and dopamine here in the synapse that can work. So that's how stimulants work for the most part. With amphetamines, there's also increased release through the transporter. And then um, uh, reverse, so you get more out um, for that reason as well. Um, and they work in both, uh, all, all over the brain, they're having this effect. Um, as we've discussed, they have a big effect. Let's go back to the one that was the beneficial. Um, so they're having a really helpful effect at low doses in prefrontal. And then there's a part of the brain called the striatum, which has dopamine, um, but very little norepinephrine. And uh, dopamine has really important effects in the striatum. It, is promoting actions and um, uh, thoughts and emotions. And it may be that some of the therapeutic effects of stimulants are through actions in stridum, but some of the abusive effects would be there as well. So we focused on, on drug effects in prefrontal because we think that's where you really need to optimize the function. Is this similar like with other, like with Adderall, for instance, I know friends that are on it and then they're off it, then they're on it, then they're off it and they're on it, then they're off it. Is it, can you do the same thing with this or is this something that you're recommending taking or recommend to take maybe constantly? Cause I just don't see the benefit in taking it and then getting off it and taking it, like hopping back and forth. I would think that you would keep taking it instead of just hopping off so quickly. Yeah. So I, my understanding is that people with stimulants do it like a cup of coffee. Um, and because it has an instantaneous kind of a, an effect and, and that they've come to learn, all right, I'm going to really need to focus to get this report done. So um, I will take my Adderall or Vyvanse this morning and work on it um, all day. Um, but I'm not going to take it um, uh, this weekend because I'm wanting uh, to compose some songs and I really am not as good at, at creative pursuits when I'm taking Adderall. Some people have told me that. With guanfacine, it's very different. You um, need to take it every day and it it creates more of a state of connectivity also since it doesn't interfere with sleep in the same way um and and so um that instead of a cup of coffee is more like something that puts your prefrontal into a healthier state and you you take it almost like i wouldn't say a vitamin but you know not what i'm saying that it's um um, um more of a, a chronic steady state medication.
And is there uh, certain age ranges that would be, I guess, targeted or maybe more focused towards, like, would you recommend it for younger kids and have it? I mean, that's where a lot of ADHD medication probably be more beneficial, especially in the education system um, was a main one. But then as an adult, like people also bring up the question when the ADHD brain's developing and or fully developed into maturity. I don't even think I'm there yet. Um, I think if they said like early, late twenties or early thirties, they talk about, I mean, only 25, I definitely got immaturity still in me. That'd probably be there for the rest of my life, hopefully. Uh, but when it fully develops, I would think that, I don't know, I, a lot of people are afraid of that. It's going to mess with the certain processes of your current natural development, which I think is a big fear and big hesitation with medication. So I'm curious if this would be something that would maybe even help when it comes to a brain's development at a younger age, would it help maybe make that left side a little bit more normal compared to what the right side would be instead of just having this certain portion that's a little bit different that could be a hindrance in later life? If I remember correctly, the data show that the medic proper medication actually helps with brain development rather than hurting. And of course, there's also the, if somebody doesn't get help, they can end up depressed from the social isolation and, and poor self-esteem and actually start self-medicating in ways that are um, harmful. Um, but I think the same thing applies to uh, a, adults. It's very much, uh, you know, how do you put your brain in an optimal healthy state? And um, that, that, um, if you're finding it's helpful, um, I, I don't think it, at the low doses that all of these things are, I don't think there's any evidence of it being harmful. They're very different at the high doses, of course. Yeah. And th that's why all the concern with Adderall and, and why um, the government um, controls how much gets manufactured. Yeah, I'm definitely not against, like I said, medication for anyone that wants to use medication. I just also look at alternative options as well, too. But I mean, I don't know, like if I had kids, if I was ever going to have kids, would I put my kid on medication? If they were curious about it and wanted to try it out, sure. I mean, I get why my parents didn't do it just because they were a little bit more hesitant. I think at the time there was a lot of that fear of like uh, being mindless or something affecting them when they get older into life. Um but, you know, I, I like I said, there's a lot of information when you look up ADHD. So trying to sort out through what's right and what's wrong, you know, and most of the public comes in contact with stuff that's on social media anyway, which I don't consider to be bad. I consider it to be helpful. But I also think you have to go a little bit further as well, too, to actually look at some actual studies and things as well, too. But yeah, social I, media know. is an echo chamber of of misinformation very often. And that is very true when it comes to a lot of science. It's not not um, that it's um, badly intentioned, um, but just that something that seems captivating and right really might not be, but then gets spread around. Um, I think in in every case, it's really a matter of how much is this person suffering. So if you have a little kid who um, nobody wants to be their friend because they're so disinhibited, it's uncomfortable being around them. Um, that's, you know, a lower threshold for treatment, right? Because you can tell they're suffering about that. So um, uh, I've certainly seen children like that where nobody wanted them to come to their birthday party. They didn't want to pick them on teams. Nobody wanted to do play dates with them and you know the poor kids getting really depressed and lonely and because of course they know that and then on medication totally transformed you know and lots of friends and and the whole ease of that so that was a very clear-cut case and i imagine there there are many people like that well, I appreciate you giving me the time to show some of your slides and be able to walk me through some of this too. Definitely gave me some new interesting things I'm going to have to start looking into a little bit more. 
Great. Yeah, no, I think uh, knowing that there's um, lots of medication options, uh, combining them with um, like working memory training, there's lots of cognitive training. Um, in my experience, the the kinds of working memory training from what I can see, it's great if you have enough of a prefrontal to actually make use of it, but oftentimes having the medication to put your prefrontal in a more optimal state allows you to make better use of it. Is there a place where people can find your lab links and any other, if you have a social media, I don't know if you do social, I don't really I do don't do media. social media on purpose. <laughs> so, it's a little bit yes. of a mess out there. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yes. And um, um, I have a lot of publications. I have some uh, YouTube videos on the Yale Medical School YouTube channel. Um, most of them are not about, um, there, there's a little bit about ADHD uh, on there, but um, for the most part, uh, uh, not. Yes, I did most of my ADHD work before the internet was such a big thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've gone on to um, a lot of other other things but. well i appreciate you you know dusting off the adhd hat for a little bit and coming back on and talking with me a little bit about some of your work um i'm going to link all your links in the description all the links to your publications anything else that i can find um in the description of the episode just so people be able to check it out um and see some of your work and i appreciate the time and thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the blank podcast